Mill's method of agreement. If two or more instances of the phenomenon under investigation have only one circumstance in common, the circumstance in which alone all instances agree is the cause or effect of the given phenomenon. Now, this is a mouthful, so let's see if we can try to um, reword some things. So if two or more instances of a phenomenon under investigation, so that's like saying if there are two unusual circumstances or there are some certain symptoms that we want to explain. So if there are some unusual circumstances that have only one circumstance in common, so I said circumstance up there, now we're saying it here, so that's getting confusing. So they have only one thing in common. So if we have some observations that we're trying to explain that only have one thing in common, that one thing in common is probably the cause or effect. Now, this isn't exactly how psychologists think about things because oftentimes um, things don't line up as neatly as they do in Mill's early explanations regarding causality. So we can imagine a picnic where we have three people and they have some phenomena. They all have stomach aches and we need to explain why they have the stomach aches. So we look and we see the things that they eat and we notice that they ate different things. So Kara had burgers and Ali had chicken and they had different things to drink. But notice that all of these people that all had stomach aches, all of them had egg salad. So when we see something like this, when we see two or more instances of the phenomenon, the stomach ache, that have only one circumstance in common, that is the um, egg salad, then that circumstance in which alone all instances agree, uh, that's just another word of saying, you know, the egg salad, because everything agrees, they all agree on egg salad, they all had it, is either the cause or effect of the given phenomenon. Now, whether it's the cause or effect, that's something that we need to, to potentially think about. Did they have the stomach aches first and that made them eat egg salad? Or did they eat the egg salad and then have the stomach aches? We could query them, ask them, and, and find out a little bit more to get a better idea about what the cause of the situation is. Whether stomach aches cause eating egg salad or vice versa. Mill's method of difference. If an instance in which the phenomenon under investigation occurs and an instance in which it does not occur have every circumstance save one in common, that one occurring only in the former, the circumstance in which alone the two instances differ, is the effect or cause or a necessary part of the cause of the phenomenon. Um, again, this is a huge mouthful. And before I, I simplify the above, I want to point out this last part. It's an effect or a cause or a necessary part of the cause. Mill understood that um, just because two things go together, it's not necessarily that one thing is the cause of the other. It, it could be that something else causes both. It could be A causes B, B causes A, or something else could possibly cause um, those two things together. So Mill is indicating sort of an understanding of this, and this is why this last part of the statement gets so long. But let's try to break this down a little bit. If an instance in which the phenomenon under the investigation occurs, that's basically if there's something interesting that we're looking at, right? And an instance in which it does not occur, so we've got some instances that are, have something and some instances that don't have that thing. Um, and there's only one thing that differs between them. This is what this part says, right? They have every circumstance save one in common. So they are completely identical in every way except for one thing and the fact that they have this difference in the phenomenon. So let's try to take a look at another picnic example to understand things. So imagine that we have people that have gas. So Jose has gas and Sam has gas, but Hunter doesn't have any gas. So what, what could we figure out? How could we figure out why they have gas. Well, we could look at the things that they ate. Notice that these first two bits, they have all had Coke, they all had burgers, right? So there's an instance in which the phenomenon under investigation occurs and an instance in which it does not occur. So the phenomenon under investigation is gas. So we have instances where it occurs and instances where it doesn't occur. And they have every circumstance except for one in common, right? So everything about these guys is identical to this point. So what do we have after this point? Well, Jose had baked beans, Sam had baked beans, but Hunter had chips. Huh. So they're completely identical except for whether or not they have baked beans or chips. 
So it must be the big beans that are causing people to have the, um, the gas. Does that make sense? So compared to the, the method of, uh, of agreement in which we had all the individuals agree on one th symptom and all of them agreed on one potential cause, here we have them disagree on the symptoms and they agree on all the potential causes except for one. And these potential causes that they disagree with match up completely with the disagreement in the symptoms. Okay, Mill's joint method of agreement and difference. So if two or more instances in which the phenomenon occurs have one circumstance in common, while two or more instances in which it does not occur have nothing in common save the absence of that circumstance, the circumstance in which alone the two sets of instances differ is the effect or cause or necessary part of the phenomenon. Again, this is a whole big mouthful, but it can really be simplified. So basically what we're saying, if we have observations of something unusual, and those observations have one thing in common, and we have other observations where we don't see that unusual thing, and those observations don't have that thing in common that the two things that have that those symptoms do, then it's that one thing in common in the group that has the symptoms that the group that doesn't have the symptoms don't have that must be the cause or the effect or necessary part of the cause. So let's again go back to a picnic example. So let's talk about inappropriate behavior. So we have Elise, Natasha, Steve, and Ralph, and Elise and Steve are acting inappropriately. We notice that everyone had burgers. So maybe the burgers could be it. Well, that, that can't be it because Natasha and Ralph aren't acting inappropriately. Let's see. Beer, soda, beer, water. Well, notice that Steve and Elise, they both had beer. So they're in agreement here. They're also in agreement here. But notice that these instances, the group that isn't in agreement with the symptoms, the inappropriate behavior, they're also not in agreement with the um, circumstance that is in agreement for those with that behavior, right? So Elise and Steve, they both had beer. Natasha and Ralph, they didn't have beer. They had something else. Finally, we got fries, cake, fruit salad, and fruit salad. Well, there's nothing similar between Elise and Steve and that, so that can't be it. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is you really don't need to have two cases that disagree. We could just as easily figure it out if we had something like this, right? So they all had burgers. Is it the burgers? Well, it can't be because Natasha, she's not acting inappropriately. It can't be the fries or the fruit salad, or, or maybe it could be. But the most likely cause is probably going to be the beer, because this is the one thing in common with the group that's acting inappropriately, and the individual that's not acting inappropriately doesn't have that in common with them. Mill's method of residuals. Subduct from any phenomenon such a part as is known by previous inductions to be the effect of certain antecedents, and the residue of the phenomenon is the effect of the remaining antecedents. Okay, again, this is a mouthful. So um, one thing I want to talk about are residue, um, or is residue. So what is residue? It's something that's left over, right? There's a residue in your bathtub after you get out, right? The soap scum around the edge. And so maybe you want to clean that. Or the residue um, that's left on your fingers after you play in the pine trees, right? It's something left over. So what we're looking for is something that's going to be left over. So subduct. This means like take out, take out from any phenomena such a part as is known by previous inductions. These previous inductions are the things that we've already been talking about, right? So we've identified that baked beans is the cause of gas. And we've identified that uh, uh, beer is the cause of some inappropriate behavior, right? So um, what we're doing is we're taking what we know already and we are excluding those possible causes from some new phenomenon, right? So subduct from any phenomena such a part as is known by previous inductions to be the effect of certain antecedents. So certain, uh, the antecedents you can think of as possible causes, right? So we know some things are possible causes and the residue, that's what's left over that of the, for the phenomena that we're in interest of. Boy, that was really poorly said. The phenomena of interest. Um, is going to be the effect. So let's take a look at another picnic example. And let's imagine that we have Maria with bad diarrhea. 
Yeah, ha, ha, ha. Maria also has um, bad gas as well. So she has diarrhea and bad gas. Well, let's figure out what she ate and what probably is the cause of the diarrhea. Well, baked beans, this causes bad, bad gas, right? We know that already because we had a whole bunch of individuals who had bad gas before. So baked beans, even though it's probably the cause of the bad gas now, it's probably not the cause of the diarrhea because those other individuals didn't have it. Burgers. Earlier we saw a bunch of people that didn't have burgers or that ate burgers and that weren't acting inappropriately or having bad gas or anything, any problems, so they're probably not the situation either. Coke. We had people that ate or that drank Coke that didn't have diarrhea. So what's left? Oysters. This, out of all the possible causes, right? Those are the antecedents all the possible causes, we get rid of those that we have already figured out what they're the cause of, or the effect of, or the necessary part of the cause, right? So we know that it's not burgers, we know that it's not the baked beans, we know that it's not the coke, so what must it be? Probably the oysters. Mill's method of concomitant variations. Before we get into the definition, I want to mention something about concomitant. So concomitant basically means something that is naturally associated or naturally goes along with something else. Um, so let's take a look at the definition. Whatever phenomenon varies in any manner, whenever another phenomenon varies in some particular manner, is either a cause or an effect of that phenomenon or is connected with it through some fact of causation. Okay, so what is this trying to say? Basically what it's saying, when we have symptoms of varying levels and we also have a potential cause that varies in an associated way, um, then that's probably the cause or related to it causally somehow. So back to our picnic, imagine we've got Larry, Mo, and Curly. And the phenomenon is that they've got the giggles. And we're trying to figure out why they have the giggles. And Larry has a little giggles, Mo has medium giggles, and Curly has lots of giggles. We look at their baked bean consumption. Larry had lots, Mo had little, and Curly had lots. Well, lots here goes with little, so if lots, if it was the baked beans, we'd expect lots to go with little there too. So that doesn't really, it's not associated naturally together. However, if we look at the special brownies that they brought, um, Larry had a little, Mo had a medium amount, and Curly had lots of it. And notice how little goes with little, medium goes with medium, and lots goes with lots. So these variations of the giggles are naturally associated with these, the variations in the amount of brownies that they ate. Knowing what we know about baked beans and gas, we would also predict that Larry and Curly should have lots of gas and Mo shouldn't have very much. That's basically using Mill's method of um, concomitant variations. Okay, so a couple last notes. Um, these are some early attempts to try to understand uh, causal effects in the world. And things really aren't as clear cut as they are in these, you know, false fabricated uh, picnic examples. Um, there are people who eat baked beans that don't suffer gas, right? Uh, maybe someone had beano. So you don't often have a situation where everyone who had baked beans has gas, or everyone who ate the um, brownies has the giggles. Maybe someone has a tolerance to the brownies that they, they ate. Maybe the oysters. Some people you know, have been eating oysters all their lives and that's not going to bother them. So we have a lot of um, variations, right? So it's not the fact that everyone that has this has this, right? It's not that everyone who gets banked as a kid is like or becomes a criminal, even though we might have evidence that individuals that are um, spanked early in childhood are more likely to commit crime. So. Um, Basically, what we're doing, we're applying sort of these methods in a probabilistic way. Instead of saying that, well, all of these individuals have to line up, we might say that these individuals share these underlying potential causes um, at greater than chance rates. So probability is going to come into a more sophisticated approach to these basic techniques that still influence how we think and how we um, understand causality.